everyone, my name is Elise and I'm part of the award-winning STEM response team here at the University of Wolverhampton. This is our last session in the biology segment and it's going to talk about variation, classification and evolution. So what is variation? We all vary as a species, whether this be between species like how a chimpanzee varies from a macaque or a gorilla or within a species, just like how birds can vary between different colours. These variations can be environmental, such as things like weight, or they can be genetic, such as coloration. Organisms from the same species share the same genes, but you can have different variations of those genes, and they are called alleles. And these can affect the morphology of the animal. So for example, how many spots they have, what their primary fur colour is, and any adaptations that they have too. But what actually is an adaptation? An adaptation is a characteristic which helps the individual animal survive within its environments. Now these can vary within populations, so it's not, it's not across the whole species, it's per individual, and they are coded by their alleles. For example, take the polar bear. It's white in colour, which helps it to camouflage. It has small ears, which helps against the cold weather in its environment, as well as its thick fur. And it has black skin, which also absorbs the sun. These are all adaptations that the animal has made and evolved to have through their environment. And these are all coded by their respective alleles. Now, genes with alleles that affect appearances are called phenotypes. You can get dominant phenotypes and recessive phenotypes. Each one of these alleles will either be dominant or recessive, and then depending on that, the phenotype will differ. So let's take this example here with two dogs. One dog has brown fur and one dog has cream fur. The allele that codes the brown fur is the dominant allele in this example, whereas the, the allele that codes cream fur is recessive. In genetics, when alleles code your phenotypes, the dominant ones will always come first if they are paired with a recessive. To show you that visually, if you look at the table here, we have some capital Ds and some lowercase Ds. Now the capital Ds for the genome are the ones that are dominant. So when you see genomes being coded, if you see a capital letter, that means that that allele in particular is dominant. If the letter is a lowercase letter, that is to signify it's a recessive one. So in our table, you can see it's called a Punnett square. And this is how we work out what the phenotype of an animal is going to be based on their genomes. So work across as you would if you do the multiplication table. You can see on the top we have a D and a, and a lowercase d and the same on the side as well. So on the top this would be the, the mother for example and on the side you would have the father's genome. In this case these genomes are heterozygous which means that they're both different. Homozygous means they're the same so if if this male was homozygous for brown fur, its genome would be two capital Ds. The same if they're homozygous for cream fur, there would be two lowercase Ds. And if they were heterozygous for brown fur, it means there would be one capital D and one lowercase D as their genome. So let's give you a human example. In humans, brown eye colour is dominant over blue eye colour. The genotype for brown eye colours can be capital Bs or a capital B and a lowercase b. Whenever there is a capital in a genome, that means that it's going to have the dominant phenotype. Whereas the genotype for blue eyes is a double lowercase b. So let's give you a small example to work through. If your mother was heterogeneous for brown eyes, and your father was homogeneous for blue eyes, what would be your genotype and phenotype? 
You can pause this video here to have a think, and once you're done, just press play for the answer. So if we look at our question, if your mother was heterogeneous or brown eyes, what does heterogeneous mean? If we remember, heterogeneous means different. So she's going to have one dominant allele and one recessive allele. So they're both different. Then your father is homogeneous for blue eyes. So remember, what does homogeneous mean? Homogeneous means they are both the same. So he's homogeneous for blue eyes, which means he has two, well, his genotype is two lowercase b's, as blue eyes are recessive. And remember, recessive genes are always shown as lowercase letters. So working with our put it square, what's it going to be? If we put the, the capital B with the lower B, we're going to have this example. So therefore, we have a 50% chance of your phenotype being either blue eyes or brown eyes. And you can work out the percentages from this put it square like this. So moving on now to evolution. Adaptations over a gradual time result in the evolution of the species. So a gradual change of characteristics over many, many generations is known as evolution. Animals evolved from a common ancestor over millions of years ago. So evolution is not a thing that happens with a few generations. It is a long period of time. So just like the polar bears, if they had to evolve small ears, it would have been throughout many, many generations, not overnight. Now, evolution by natural selection was first thought about or discovered by this man here, Charles Darwin. Now, in 1859, Charles Darwin took a voyage with his researchers around the coast of South America, exploring what kind of wildlife he found there. Now, he came to a, an archipelago of islands called the Galapagos, and on these islands, he found a very important scientific theory. He noticed that there was many species of finches on these islands, but the species all slightly differed between the islands. Now, his theory was that the finches adapted and evolved to suit their environments. Those that had better adaptions multiplied and reproduced with each other to produce stronger offspring. Those which didn't adapt reproduced to make uh, weaker offspring or maybe no offspring at all. And therefore, the weaker adaptations died out and the stronger ones survived. And this is just how natural selection works. So you can see here this example of some finches on the Galapagos. They all have different beak shapes. And this is what Darwin noticed. Some finches had large beaks to eat buds, whereas some finches had short, thin beaks to pick up insects. So Darwin came to the conclusion about the theory of natural selection, that animals change their surroundings based on their ability to ability to survive and the ability to get resources in their environment. So the last thing that we're going to run through today is classification. And you'll go through this in biology. If you study animals or plants or fungi, you will come across these classification charts and trees. Classification is just sorting animals into different groups and making them into a hierarchy. Classification trees can be based on a variety of points, such as morphology, but our main ones that we'll be looking at today are genetics. So, we have an example here of a grey mouse lemur. And on the left, you'll see a list of all the different classifications that this grey mouse lemur can fit into. So we'll start off with the top one, domain. Its domain is eukarya. So that means it's part of an animal or an organism that has eukaryotic cells. It then goes down into kingdom. So its kingdom is animalia. It's not a plant, it's not a fungi, it's an animal. After that, we have phylum. And the phylum is chordata. And that means it's a vertebrae. So this is any animal that has a backbone. After that, we go down into class. 
Its class is mammalia or mammals. This is where you'd have your differentiation between your mammals, your reptiles and your birds and fish, for example. And then we have our order. Its order just funnels it down even further into primates. You'll then see we have something called a suborder and an infraorder. In this case, the suborder is Strepsohenery, which are the lesser primates, the primates which aren't so evolved as the other ones, like your apes. And then our infraorder is Lemurforms. Going even further down that funnel, we then have the family of Shirogalidae, which means dwarf lemurs. We then have our genus, Microcebus, which means mouse lemurs. And finally, we have our individual species called Marinus. So you can see now how the grey mouse lemur is funnelled between these classifications. So that was just one example using our grey mouse lemur. And you'll see if you look to its scientific name, which is in italics below the actual name, it does say Microcebus marinus. So your scientific name is the genus and then the species. So that's the end of this session. What I want you to go and do now, if you have time, is pick an animal or a plant of your choice and just do some research and look at the different classifications that it fits into, just to understand in more detail with an example that you like. Thank you all for watching and we hope you've enjoyed this biology catch-up series.